Hey guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder Podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? Doing good. We're kind of having, oh gosh, here I go talking about the weather. I noticed that it's going to get cooler this week. Is that a thing it is, that yeah. a thing people care about? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, actually, I will have to say that it has been been even for Florida it has been unusually warm like all winter so far like oh, pretty yeah. much the last I mean we didn't really have any cool weather in the fall it was just Mm-mm. it's been very warm it's been kind of weird so yeah we do have um some cooler weather moving through I guess I can't say cold but no I mean, we can't say yeah cold. today it's a lot nicer um and cooler and more enjoyable I love it when it does this because then I like to get outside and go enjoy I know it. it's beautiful it's it's really perfect weather cuz you know by the afternoon you can be in short sleeves I mean, in the mornings, I'll like take the dog for a walk and wear like a sweatshirt, but like it's not that cold, but to me it is. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like that perfect, like, oh, it feels so nice out here. So, but I do feel bad because people, it's been crazy weather for other people. I feel awful. Yeah. Like the snow I've seen and like there's flooding in some areas and there was like a whole, you know, interstate blocked off. I feel so bad. So I apologize if that came off as bragging about our weather. But no, no. It's just, you know, a comment, like a, just an observation. It has yeah. been very warm for us here this year. Um, which is actually unusual because we normally do have – a lot of people just think it's hot all the time in Florida, but it actually does usually get pretty cold in the winter. We have some days where it gets down to a freezing temperature or below, and um, that's cold. I don't care if you are used to negative d- temperatures. Yeah. It's still cold when it's 30 degrees. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know, get so- at least two of the announcements to, like, bring your animals in yeah. and cover your plants <laughs> <laughs> here. We haven't gotten any yet. Right, exactly. So yeah, but other than that, you know, as we said last week, this is that time of year when it's just not very exciting, not a lot going on. So therefore, I don't have a lot to say this week to start the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, here's something interesting. We have a listener um, from Canada, and she wrote us a few weeks ago on Twitter and was like, oh, I heard one of your episodes about Miami, and I decided to go visit. And so she went to visit, and then a couple days ago- Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, because of a murder? But no, she was like, you guys talked about Florida, and it sounded so cool. So she came down, and then like probably a week- a week ago, and I'm sorry I don't have your name pulled up. She said um, something, something. You guys did another something about Florida, and she's like, "I'm still here." And she posted a picture of the beach. I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" She's like, oh. "I'm not going back to Canada. It's freezing." Oh my right goodness. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we I sh- mean, we should hey. be hired by the tourism board, right? Yeah, or not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> if we talk about Florida, it's normally about murders. Probably not the way you want to sell it here, right? But, you know, we're doing our best. Yeah. For sure. We really are. (laughs) All right. So we'll get into the story for this week. Um, This is a story that is very fascinating to me. And there are a lot of different types of crime cases that are fascinating to me. But some of the stories that really keep me up at night are the ones where somebody has been murdered at the hands of their own child. Personally, for me, I can't think of anything like more of a scary, like a real life scary thought than this like happening. No, it's this precious little person you've brought into the world. And to think that they could do that to you is it's unbelievable. It is really hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah, it is. Uh, So according to Times of Malta, a decades long study conducted by Kathleen Heidi from the University of South Florida showed that five children kill their biological parents every week. That sounds like a lot, but matricide and patricide are considered extremely rare and only account for one out of every 100 homicides in the country. The same article that was published in 2019 states that children killing their parents is the fastest growing type of family homicide Mm -hmm. and that these crimes are most commonly committed by sons aged 16 to 19 and they are least often committed by daughters under age 18. Statistics from the National Library of Medicine show that matricide, which is the killing of mothers by their biological children, comprises less than 2% of all murders in the U.S., but that still kind of amounts to a lot. So to put that into perspective, in 2020, there were more than 21,500 murders. So 2% of that would still be 430 women killed at the hands Mm -hmm. of their own child, which it it doesn't sound like a lot until it does, you know, until you actually break it down. (laughs) You know, and you're like, wait a minute, 430 moms being killed by their children. That's just Uh, unfathomable to me. I can't imagine that the number would be that high. Something interesting I also came across was that in 2020, uh, murders were actually up 30%. And that was the largest single year increase on record. So we don't have the stats for 2021 yet. But I'm really going to be interested to see um, what those end up looking like, how those numbers have changed. 
So we talk about numbers and statistics sometimes on the show, not all the time. But personally, it makes me feel better usually to know the actual numbers. In this case, I didn't find it really that comforting to know that (laughs) hundreds of people are actually killed by their kids every year. So Dr. Ziv Cohen, who is a former president of the American Society for Adolescent Psychiatry, says that adolescents who kill their parents typically fall into one of three different categories. The first group is suffering from severe mental illness. The second group may be involved in crime or drug abuse. And the third group may have suffered severe abuse or high family conflict in their home growing up. No matter how you try to explain it, though, nobody ever goes into parenthood with the thought that their precious bundle of joy will grow up and kill them one day. Oh, man, all I can think about right now is the people that have written in the last few months that are like, I'm on maternity leave and I listen to you guys while rocking my baby to sleep. Oh, my gosh, I know. I'm so sorry about this one. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So Vicki Robinson was a woman just like many others trying to get by and survive her day-to-day life as a recently divorced mom to two teenage daughters. Although Vicky's marriage to her husband, Chuck, lasted for 14 years, it didn't work out in the long run, and now Vicky was living in Tampa, Florida, with her daughters, Michelle and Valessa, who were both just entering their adolescent years at the time of their parents' divorce. Valessa was just 11 years old, and Michelle was 13 at the time. Vicky was making the most of her situation, working as a real estate agent to support herself and her girls. She was an active member of her church, as well as a Christian group called Single Purpose. She also loved children and volunteered with a local Head Start program and taught preschool. Vicky was very motherly. She was the type of woman that would bake you homemade cookies and make you soup if you were sick, and she always maintained this positive, cheerful attitude that really made her a joy to be around. But when it came to her own daughters, things weren't exactly the way you might think. Vicky was really trying her best, but her youngest daughter, Valessa, had been struggling since the divorce. When Vicky and Chuck separated, Chuck moved out of Florida to find work, which meant that not only did Valesa and Michelle have to deal with the divorce itself, but they also had to come to terms with seeing their dad a lot less than they were used to seeing him. Valesa really took this very hard. She was devastated about her parents getting a divorce, and she really missed her dad a lot. After the divorce, Vicky had to take up full-time work, which kept her busy, but she also had a social life and a full calendar, so Valesa often felt like she didn't have anyone around. In addition to these troubles at home, Valesa was also bullied in school. As we said, she was around 11 or 12 throughout this period, and we all know how middle schoolers can be. It's really not the most fun time in a kid's life. I'm always telling that to my daughter. I'm like, I have never met one person in my life who says, you know what I wish I could do? Go back in time and be in middle school. No (laughs) No, one says that. It's the worst. I know. I tell my son that too. He's in the sixth grade, so he's just you know starting the middle school journey. But I told him, I'm like, this is like, do not come under any like illusion that this is like the best time you know like it's totally not yeah (laughs) yeah once you make it through this like it starts getting better after middle school (laughs) yeah um so to cope with everything that Valesa had going on in her life she started journaling in 1995 she wrote about all of the things uh really the trouble that she was getting into like vandalizing mailboxes and shoplifting and getting messed up I can assume she means on drugs or alcohol or both. And that's really disturbing considering she was 11 years old at the time of writing this. She also wrote about going to the fall with her friends and crushes. So I'm not sure what the fall is, but it sounds maybe just like a place, you know, where teens go to hang out or kind of like a hangout spot, maybe where they're not even supposed to be hanging out, probably like a loitering situation or something. I don't know, but it was called the fall. Um, So it seemed like Vicky really had little knowledge about Valesa's whereabouts and activities, or she was just very naive about it at the very least. When Valesa was 12, Vicky allowed her to join a rock band, and that wouldn't have been a big deal if it had been a band full of 12-year-olds, but the other members of this band were all men in their 20s. So as a result of joining this band, Valesa was introduced to hard drugs like acid and ecstasy before she was even a teenager. She began staying out all night and skipping school during the day. Vicky was seeing a new man at the time named Jim, and he said that Valesa was just out of control and was beyond discipline at this stage. Vicky's co-workers also knew of the struggles that she was having with her daughter and knew that Vicky felt like she was just at a loss with how to handle the whole situation. Vicky had tried the tough love approach, and she also tried the gentle approach, but nothing really seemed to work to rein in Valesa's bad behavior. When she was 14, she was introduced to an 18-year-old named Adam Davis, and things went even further downhill from there. 
Adam was living on the streets when he and Valesa developed an obsessive codependent relationship. Adam was extremely controlling, and Vicky made it very clear that she did not approve of this fling. But when it came to actually doing something about it, Vicky took no real action. It's hard to imagine what Vicky was thinking, but she seemed to really have her head in the sand when it came to Valesa. Also, when Valesa was 14, Vicky and her new boyfriend, Jim, took a two-week-long trip to Michigan. It was supposed to be a family vacation, but Valesa refused to go with them. So Vicky just kind of threw her hands up and let her daughter stay home while the rest of them went. Valesa's father found out about this and thought it was absolutely just insane that his ex-wife would leave their 14-year-old daughter unattended for two weeks, especially when she has this much older boyfriend hanging around. So who was this Adam and where did he come from? His full name was Adam William Davis, and he was born in Little Rock, Arkansas on December 10th, 1978 to parents Tamara and Kenneth. He really didn't have a privileged upbringing. He suffered through really many hardships and lived a deprived childhood. His mother abandoned him when he was just a toddler, and his father raised him in Tampa and Zephyr Hills, Florida. When Adam was 13, his father died tragically in a motorcycle accident, leaving him orphaned and bouncing between the homes of various family members and relatives in South Dakota, Oregon, and Arizona. Eventually, though, Adam returned to Tampa, which was the place he'd really always known as home. He dropped out of high school, and he turned to drug dealing as a way of life. And that's what he was doing when he first met 14-year-old Valesa. In addition to the tragic events of his childhood, Adam also had some other problems, and mostly these problems were with the law. He had a very lengthy criminal history. In 1995, Adam was arrested six times on charges of car theft, shoplifting, and larceny. He was 17 when he committed the string of crimes. In 1997, he pleaded guilty to stealing a motorcycle and burglarizing a business. In June of that same year, he violated his probation and fled the state, leading police to issue a warrant for his arrest. Several months later, in October, police finally located him. He was actually living in an abandoned house with his friend John. They had broken into this house, ransacked it, and stole a 10-inch knife and a 120,000 volt taser gun. I don't know anything about taser guns, but I feel like once you hit 120,000 volts of anything, (laughs) that (laughs) is serious. Yeah. Yeah. So Adam was found guilty again on charges of grand theft, burglary, criminal mischief, and armed trespassing. He was given a six-month jail sentence for this. And so this is really the guy that this young Valesa was head over heels in love for. And just when it seemed like Valesa's outrageous behavior couldn't get any worse, she started trying to have a baby at the age of 14. On May 11, 1998, she wrote in her diary that Adam was her one true love and that soon she would have his last name. She wrote that they had slept together eight times and said, quote, We're trying to get me pregnant because I want a baby so bad. Just imagine a little version of me running around. Scary, isn't it? End quote. Which, yes, it is terrifying that a 14-year-old would write those words. Yeah. I just, do we need to bring back those things where, like, you had to have an egg that you took care of in school? Or, like, the crying little baby thing? Like, something. Like, this is romanticizing having children to a degree I can't even understand. But there's got to be some, like loneliness you know that this is coming from like if i have this part of a part of me a part of this guy then they will love me unconditionally i get where this is going but man right yeah the idea of having a baby at 14 right and wanting one it just seems it's It's blowing my mind over here yeah it's terrifying um but also in this diary she wrote about how adam drank too much and that he stole things and also said that he was suicidal but she said there still wasn't anyone on the earth that she would rather have a baby with. She said that he was a sweetheart and she loved him to death. The same month that Valesa wrote these things in her journal, she also ran away from home. This resulted in Adam's arrest because the police believed that he helped her, and we'll go into more detail about what happened with that in just a little bit. But Adam was actually charged with child abuse after this event. But after Valesa's runaway stunt, Vicky knew that she really had to do something. So she decided to start taking Valesa to counseling, and she also got counseling for herself. Vicky decided to enroll Valesa in an intense program for troubled teens, and the program was a year long. It was called Steppenstone Farm, and she was supposed to begin this program in early August. 
So it seems like things are maybe headed in a better direction for Vicky and her daughter. But they actually took a tragic and sudden turn one day in late June of that year. Living in Florida has its perks, and one of them is that you can really plan quick and easy trips to the beach, particularly if you live in a place like Tampa that's right on the coast. So on June 27th, Vicky and her boyfriend Jim had planned for a beach day, but when Vicky never called him to confirm their plans, he became worried. Jim reported Vicky missing and told police that her van was gone from her house, and so was her daughter, Valesa. Vicky's other daughter, Michelle, was actually staying with her dad that summer. Jim also told officers that he found out that Vicky had missed several appointments with her clients that day, which was extremely odd because Vicky took her real estate work very, very seriously. He was able to convince officers to conduct a welfare check on Vicky. Officers broke into the home and Jim looked around and immediately noticed that Vicky's bed was unmade, which he told police was highly unusual. Vicky was extremely tidy and made her bed every day. And the fact that it wasn't, you know, meant to him, something is definitely wrong. Investigators checked into the activity of Vicky's bank account and quickly realized that her ATM card had been used. So they tracked down the surveillance footage from where the card was used to try and see who made the transaction. To their surprise, the person who used Vicky's card was not Vicky. It was two men later identified as Adam Davis and John Wispel. Yeah, that's Valesa's boyfriend and his friend slash roommate. Authorities immediately began looking for these two men. There was no sign of Vicky or Valesa, which led Vicky's parents to believe that the two of them were being held hostage somewhere. They thought there would be some sort of a ransom note that was coming soon. Vicky's mom, Donna, said all she could think was that someone had Vicky tied up somewhere, but she never believed her daughter or granddaughter were actually hurt. Valesa was listed as a missing or endangered runaway, while officers worked to find her as well. It didn't take very long for word of Vicky's disappearance to hit the news. And when Adam heard that the media was reporting on this story, he and Valesa and John decided that they should skip town right away. Obviously, you've done something if you're trying to to leave out of here. So the trio gets on I-10 and they drive all the way to Phoenix, Arizona, staying along the interstate and using Vicky's ATM card along the way. At some point, officers receive this anonymous tip from someone who claimed that they had spoken to Adam. And the caller said that according to Adam, Vicky was dead and Valesa was alive and they, meaning Adam and Valesa, had hit her mom, knocked her unconscious, and then killed her. Police were unsure at this point whether or not Valesa was a victim or an accomplice, so they kept tracking the bank account, but it was kind of like a game of cat and mouse. They would always miss their opportunities to move in and arrest the teens. They were always just, you know, one step behind. Mm. On July 2nd, bank activity showed that a transaction was made near Pecos County, Texas, so Texas authorities were then alerted and they joined in the search. The sheriff believed that these teens would likely be hanging out near I-10 or driving on I-10, so he headed out to keep an eye out for Vicky's van, which was the vehicle that these teens were believed to be traveling in. At around 12 p.m., believe it or not, which I actually found this very hard to believe for some reason, but yeah. Sher- Sheriff Wilson, the guy who was actually just hanging out, like parked on the side of I-10, actually spotted the van they were looking for, which I guess it's not that crazy, but it kind of is because they were only looking on I-10 off of a hunch they had that that's where they would be in the first place. And then the fact that he did actually see them is just crazy to me that it just worked out that way. Like, there they are. you know, Here they come right down I-10 like we thought. So um, a high-speed chase actually ensued um, when the officer saw them. Wilson instructed his deputies to shoot out the tires of the van, and they did. So the van lost control and then finally came to a stop. Officers ordered Adam, John, and Valesa to get out of the van, but they refused, so the police had to remove them from the car by force. Sheriff Wilson said that as soon as he saw Valesa, he knew that she wasn't a victim of any kind. He said, quote, I saw a girl that was very much there because she wanted to be, and probably a girl that took just as big of a part or bigger than the two boys. All three of them were arrested and separated. Valesa was taken to a juvenile detention center, while Adam and John were taken to a normal jail. As it turned out, all three of them were actually high on acid when they were arrested. Oh my gosh. Honestly, it it just is scary to me. See, I've always been one of those people who was like scared of hard drugs, like actually scared of dying from taking drugs. And so the thought of a 14-year-old taking drugs to me, like it gives me so much anxiety just thinking of a person that young on 
something yeah. like acid. It's, it's just, very scary. It's very serious. Yeah. It's, it's so young. So, it's so terrifying. Young. It's so scary to think about. Later on, when the van was searched, police found an old-fashioned lawn edger, a hoe, a brown leather suitcase, a cooler, a keyboard, an electric guitar case, a copy of The Born Identity by Robert Ludlum, a partly eaten loaf of bread, a carton of Marlboro cigarettes, and a bag of gummy bears. Sounds like everything you need for a road trip. <laughs> yeah, that's – and then some. That is quite a, like yeah, – I don't, I don't even know. That is. <laughs> yeah, so the next day, investigators from Florida arrived in Texas so that they could interview the three suspects. Valesa was the first to be interviewed. They explained that they were looking for her mom, who was missing, and they asked if Valesa knew anything about her mom's whereabouts. Valesa denied knowing anything at first, but after just 10 minutes of pleading with her, the authorities started to actually get somewhere. Valesa suddenly confessed to killing her mom, but said that she had done it alone and she couldn't recall the details because she was high on LSD when it happened. She said that she did remember Adam and John being in her bedroom while she was in the kitchen with her mom. And she said that an argument broke out between them and Valesa then grabbed a knife and stabbed Vicky in the throat and in the back. Valesa told the officers that once she realized what happened, she panicked and went back to her room and asked Adam and John to take care of all the blood. She said they took Vicky's body and put it in a trash can, with the plan being that they would bury her. But then they ran into a few problems, so they just left the body somewhere and were going to go back later and bury it. Valesa then drew the police a map of where they allegedly left Vicky's body. And we're going to get into a lot more details of this story after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. If you love listening to our show, we know you love a good whodunit more than most. And if you're looking for another way to tickle that itch, look no further than June's Journey. June's Journey is a free-to-download game following June Parker, an amateur detective investigating a series of mysteries with twists and turns around every corner. As my family's resident, where is this thing I'm missing person, I can really excel at June's Journey. While enjoying the glamour of the Roaring Twenties, I can put on my Sherlock hat and help solve mysteries as June Parker, who has a much more glamorous life than I do. I enjoy playing June's Journey while vegging out at night, watching The Real Housewives, eating literally every snack that's in my house, or even listening to my son give a dissertation on the meanings and the beginnings of Minecraft, which is exactly as much fun as it sounds like. I'm in chapter two, and what's great is there are new chapters added every week, so you always have something new and exciting to look forward to. You guys will love the beautiful and immersive scenes filled with drama, danger, and heck, even a little romance. Ready to awaken your inner detective? Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Whatever goals you have for this year, one of the best ways to set yourself up for success is with a good night's sleep. With Sleep Number, you can do just that. I have a friend that has a very strict sleep schedule for herself, and at first I thought it was a little much until I tried it. It's amazing how much I can accomplish without the brain haze that I get when I stay up too late or I'm tossing and turning, but with my sleep number bed, I'm catching my Z's and starting my day off with a little pep in my step. My perfect sleep number score is a 30 because I like a softer bed, and my sleep IQ is between an 85 and 95, which is incredible as someone who has struggled with getting a good night's sleep for years. And if you're interested in getting an amazing night's sleep and visiting the sleep number store, not only do you get the VIP treatment, you also get to try out all of their beds, which are so incredibly magical, it feels criminal. You guys have heard me talk about my cloud bed, and I will forever sing its praises because it feels just like sleeping on a fluffy cloud. I discovered that my perfect sleep number setting is a 30, but occasionally I even go down to a 25 for an even softer, fluffier experience. I always wake up feeling like I got the best night of sleep, and my sleep IQ score of 87 confirms that I am sleeping better than ever. Discover special offers now for a limited time at your local sleep number store or sleepnumber.com slash moms. Sleep number, proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. And now back to the episode. So before the episode, we were talking about the arrest of these three uh, people in connection with Vicki Robinson's murder, and Valesa has really just given her first confession, basically, telling police what had happened that night and even drawing a map as to where Vicki's body could be found. So what officers were soon to find out was that Valesa was telling the truth, at least partly. After interviewing both Adam and John, police put together a picture of what actually happened that night. John and Adam actually both admitted to having a part in the murder of Alessa's mom. According to these three stories combined, this is what happened. 
On June 26, 1998, 49-year-old Vicky spent the day running errands with 15-year-old Valesa and 19-year-olds Adam and John. This was really relatively a normal day. Later that evening, Jim, who was Vicky's boyfriend, came over for dinner, and at around 11.30 that night, Valesa and the two young men showed up at the house as well, but they all went straight to Valesa's room. Since it was getting late, Jim decided he should head out, and he asked Adam and John if they wanted a ride home before he left. The two said no, and Jim left. After Jim left, Adam and John also left on their bikes to go to Denny's to get something to eat, and Valesa would later sneak out of the house to meet them there. Once Valesa got back together with the guys, they all went to go buy some LSD, which they took, and then they went back to Denny's to enjoy their acid trip with a side of hash browns. I just don't understand what time it has to be by this point. If Jim left at 1130 and then they, you know, all went, it has to be by the time they went and got LSD and did did it and then went back to Denny's, it has to be like two o'clock in the morning at this time. Yes. And that is said as someone that is heading towards her mid thirties. It's definitely (laughs) very late. (laughs) I know. I'm like, what happens after 10 p.m.? There's possibly, there's nothing that's going on. I know. I'm like the most confused about this whole story I am is the fact that they're doing all this literally in the middle of the night. I just. 2.30 at night? (laughs) (laughs) It's so late. Yeah, I know. And so as these teens are sitting around the table, they're feeling kind of bored and they're wondering what to do next. And that's when Valesa is struck with this idea. They could kill her mom. John thought that she was joking, of course, uh, but then Adam and Valesa actually start talking about actual ways to murder Vicky and things quickly snowballed from there. Adam had the idea of injecting Vicky with a lethal dose of heroin and making it look like an accidental overdose. So they left the Denny's and went back to Vicky's house where they waited to make sure she was asleep before sneaking back inside the house. At this point, the goal here is to steal the keys to Vicky's van so they could drive somewhere to buy heroin. So Valesa uses the spare key they have to put the car in neutral so the guys could push it out from the garage into the street so it wouldn't wake Vicky up whenever they started it to drive off. Again, what time is it? (laughs) I just cannot, like, this is so much. This is so much. I know. It's a lot of planning to have happened in such a small, like, to happen over crappy eggs. You know what I mean? Like, And it's while a you're lot. high on LSD. That's probably where most of this is coming from, though. Like, that actually makes the most sense out of all of this, that they're doing this stuff at 2.30 and high on something, you know? Like, because it yeah. does not make any sense otherwise. So Adam's behind the wheel, and the trio drove to his friend's house and asked how much heroin that they could buy. They said they were wanting enough to take someone out. Oh, and my gosh. This friend did not have any heroin to sell them or was like, maybe I don't want to get involved. But he does have a syringe, which Adam actually buys. That's when they take the syringe and they head back to Vicky's house. So when the teens arrived back at the house, they made their way to Valesa's bedroom quietly so that they could discuss their final plans. Or I guess come up with a new plan since this heroin plan wasn't going to work out. So now they have to kind of start from square one. So Adam told Valesa to get some bleach and a glass so that they could inject Vicky with bleach and an air bubble using the syringe that they just bought. Valesa did as she was told. Adam filled the syringe with bleach and air and then grabbed his pocket knife before he and Valesa crept into Vicky's bedroom. Vicky actually started to wake up when they went into the room. So they went back to Valesa's room and they stashed the syringe and the bleach in her closet and they put the knife in her dresser. A few minutes later, Vicky came down the hall and knocked on Valesa's bedroom door and told her to get her sleeping bag and to come in her room and sleep for the night. Of course, you know, she's waking up in the middle of the night realizing Valesa is still awake. These guys are here. You know, she needs to go to bed. Like, so she tells her, you know, as a mom to the daughter, get your sleeping bag. You're coming in my room to come sleep with me tonight. So Adam, who was in the room, handed Valesa her sleeping bag and he then followed Vicky as she started to walk into the kitchen. With no warning, Adam lunged at Vicky and put her in a sleeper hold, nearly strangling her to the point of unconsciousness as they struggled to the floor. At this point, Adam started shouting for Valesa to get the syringe, but Valesa didn't really know exactly where he put it, so instead Adam told her to get on the ground and hold her mom down while he went to get the syringe himself. Meanwhile, Vicky was fighting for her life. She was trying to get them off of her, was asking, you know, screaming, what are you doing to me? Adam returned with a syringe, but with Vicky's protesting and as hard as she was fighting back, it was really hard to inject her with it. But after several tries, Adam did pierce Vicky's neck with the needle and he injected the syringe into her. 
Adam and Valesa then held Vicky down while they waited for the injection to work, but it never did. Vicky was still very much alive and still fighting back. At this point, Adam's friend John came in with a knife and told Adam to use that instead. And then John left the room and went back into Valesa's bedroom. Oh my gosh. Adam continued this attack on Vicky, stabbing her several times in the neck and back. After a while, Adam and Valesa returned to her bedroom where John was. John noticed that Adam was holding the knife in his left hand and noticed that he had blood on the knife and on himself, but Valesa did not have any blood on her hands. Adam got himself cleaned up, washed the blood off, and then the three teens started smoking cigarettes and discussing what to do. Suddenly, though, they heard Vicky moaning from the kitchen. She was still alive after all of this. So Adam grabs a knife and remarks that Vicky, quote, just won't die, end quote, and he goes to finish the job. This is so awful. Yeah. Adam stabbed Vicky two more times and tried to break her neck. Hours later, the murderous teens used bleach and towels to clean up the kitchen, and Adam put Vicky's body into a trash can that he found in Vicky's garage. They then took the trash can, the soiled towels used in the cleanup, shovels, and more into Vicky's van and set off to find a place to dispose of her body. Adam and John first attempted to dig a hole to bury Vicky in, but digging holes is a lot harder than it looks, and they gave up on that idea very quickly. They decided to hide the trash can containing Vicky's body with some foliage and planned to come back to deal with it later. From there, the teens went back to the crime scene so that they could get Vicky's credit cards, cash, and bank card, which Valesa knew the PIN number for. For the next three days, they partied it up in Ybor City, using Vicky's money to fund hotels and meals. Valesa even took the guys shopping and bought Adam and John $600 worth of tattoos and piercings. Can you imagine uh, after this has happened, if you're the tattoo artist and hearing about this and just thinking, oh my my gosh, gosh, I know. Anybody that comes in contact, but for some reason that's just in my head because you're sitting there. That's like such a personal thing to have a tattoo and sitting yeah. with somebody that long. So Adam's tattoo was a of jester faces um, and John got a skull and they both also got their eyebrows pierced. While at the tattoo shop, Valesa and Adam kept talking about how they were going to move to Arizona and have kids together and one day get married. On the third day, June 29th, the three teens went to another friend's house to hang out. Valesa laid on the couch the whole time and said she didn't feel good, but she also said to Adam at one point, quote, I want a baby. When are we going to have a baby? End quote. Oh my gosh. This is, it's unbelievable to, tr- to attempt to wrap your mind around this. It, it's impossible. And you have to believe it's true because it, it is just so out there. Like if you've yeah. already killed your mom, it makes sense that maybe you would say something like this because this is just wild. So they also spent Vicky's money on 20 bags of concrete, a bucket, and a trash can. Their master plan was to encase Vicky's body in concrete and then dump it in a nearby canal. So after hearing their confessions, Valesa, Adam, and John were all charged with first-degree murder. Six hours later, Florida authorities followed the directions and the map to where the teens allegedly left Vicky's body. They arrived at a dirt road with a rusted cattle fence that had been locked by a chain before the trio cut a link with some bolt cutters. So the authorities opened the fence and they kept going down the road until they reached the end where they got out and saw that there was a walking path. So they went about a mile deep into the brush and investigators then found a garbage bag that had bleach, towels, and blood inside. They also found a pitchfork and two shovels nearby, as well as marks in the ground from where Adam and John had actually attempted to start digging a grave. Just a short distance away, officers found the garbage can, half covered with palm leaves. An autopsy later confirmed that Vicki had been alive throughout most of the attack on her life and that she ultimately died from blood loss. After the teens were arrested, they were not allowed to talk to each other or write to each other, but Adam and Valesa really tried their darndest anyway. They asked a friend to patch them through to each other during calls, and the same friend also bought a recording device that allowed Valesa and Adam to leave these long-winded messages to each other. When they got caught for doing this, both of them lost all of their phone privileges. When Valesa and Adam saw each other at court hearings, which, of course, now is the only time they can see each other, they would smile and they would make hand signals to each other, even though they were both in handcuffs, but they would mouth words to each other and just, you could tell they were trying to communicate. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. So the judge ordered for their hearings to then be held separately from that point on. 
But still, Valesa persisted in her efforts to contact Adam. She wrote him letters and she would get she would try to get them through by writing in like her own made up hieroglyphics and (laughs) I guess sent him like a code like here, like decode this message because oh my gosh, the police can't do it. Just as easily, I guess. I don't know. Carmen San Diego clues or something. I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I don't get it. So um, some of these letters were actually made public. So this is the kind of stuff that she was writing down. Quote, hopefully one day Adam and I will be together again. If so, then we'll be able to continue our plans of getting married and starting a family. If that happens, then my lifelong dream will have come true. True love always finds a way. Another instance she wrote, Even if Adam's love for me dies, my love for him will continue for the rest of eternity. Even if Adam says that everything that happened was my doing and he gets set free and goes off and gets married and starts a family and I spend the rest of my life in jail, that would be fine with me because I would give my entire life if it made Adam happy. End quote. I just like every word in my head is just I don't have complete thoughts at this point. Like I like just yeah. read and like, it's just, oh my gosh. Like, I know. I know. It, it's amazing to me that they were still communicating after like, this seems to have gone on for a while that she's still professing her yeah. love for but him. But then again, also it's different when you are having those emotions at 14 years old and you right. really do feel like very strong, you know, attraction to somebody and like it's it's different. And so I, I that's it. That's I can't it help but you. feel like that plays a huge part, you know. Oh, for this totally. Part for her. Yeah. And at this point, look at everything you've done. Like it has to be worth something, right? Like there right. Ha- that you have to have in your mind to be able to justify what you've done, that there is this ultimate true love fantasy that's there. Or how do you live with yourself? Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So she was very invested in this future and this relationship that she had with Adam. Adam later gave an interview to a reporter. He said he was retracting his confession. He never hurt Vicky. He said, quote, me and Valessa's mom got along great. We never had any problems, end quote. Adam said that his biggest fear was losing Valessa, that she was his family. He said, quote, she's pretty much all I got right now. She's my soulmate, end quote. Valesa actually spoke with the same reporter, and she said, quote, we've pretty much given each other a reason to live, and we're going to spend the rest of our lives together, end quote. When asked what happened on the night that Vicky was murdered, Valesa said, quote, whatever happened that night wasn't supposed to happen. And Valesa said that she missed her mom terribly, and she cried every single day. And she said that she thinks that Vicky has forgiven her. She said, quote, I think that she understands what happened that night, end quote. Valesa said, quote, I'm willing to accept the responsibility of going to prison. I think I deserve it. I think I deserve to go for a while to think about what has happened and what I've done, end quote. Which to me, that last sentence sounds so much like a kid getting sent to their room, right? Yeah, like, yep. why were you sent to your room? I need to think about my thoughts. Like, I need to think about what I've done. Like, it's just such a young, a young way of thinking. And like, I don't know, it just speaks to where she was at at this time. So John became so stressed in jail that his hair started falling out in clumps. His head was shaved, but he still had like a silver dollar sized bald patch on his scalp, like on various places. And he was told that it was due to stress. His attorney, Brian Gonzalez, wanted to get a deal for John. He knew that John hadn't implicated himself directly in the murder. Brian figured that the state would want John to testify against Valesa at trial since Valesa's story was that she committed the murder all by herself, which really didn't seem possible. Brian wanted to make sure that John's story checked out, so he goes over to Vicky's house and does a complete crime scene reconstruction. His story made sense, at least according to the evidence. Brian spoke with the prosecution and they came up with a deal. John would plead guilty to second-degree murder and he would testify against Adam and Valesa. In return, he would get 25 years in prison. If he didn't take the deal, John actually faced the death penalty, so he took the deal. On June 29th, 1999, John pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, grand theft, and grand theft auto. He was sentenced to 25 years for murder and five years for each grand theft conviction. When it came to Adam and Valesa's trials, though, things weren't quite as simple. Adam's defense team had him meet with a clinical psychologist for an evaluation, and during this evaluation, Dr. Michael Gamachi said that Adam, quote, grossly exaggerated problems of a mental health and mental illness nature. 
This doctor said that the way Adam recounted the murder to him was bone chilling. And the results of the evaluation ended up actually being damning to the defense's case of voluntary intoxication because Adam had said things to Dr. Gamachi that proved that he knew what he was doing during the murder. So they actually ended up not using a whole lot of the evaluation at the trial later because it like didn't do anything for them. them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So the defense was actually afraid that the jury would hear certain things and then they wouldn't believe that Adam was too impaired to know what he was doing, which was their whole entire defense, right? Like that he was on drugs. He didn't know what he was doing. That's their – that's what they're going with. But if the jury doesn't believe that, then that – your whole case is like gone. So Adam wanted to use this defense of voluntary intoxication, but it ended up not really working out because an expert told the defense that LSD does not prevent an individual from planning things or forming the intent to act. The expert did say that Adam's actions were based on distorted perceptions, but didn't really specify what distortions were there at the time. Adam's trial began on November 1st, 1999. Prosecutors said that he and Valesa wanted to kill her mom because she didn't approve of their relationship. Adam's defense did the best they could with what they had, you know, considering the defense that Adam was adamant about putting forward was this voluntary intoxication defense. So they admitted that Adam was involved in the murder, but they said that Valesa was the actual killer and that Adam was just an accessory after the fact. For this reason, they asked the jury to consider a lesser offense than first degree murder. Valesa was not called as a witness during Adam's trial because the defense was worried that one of two things might happen. Number one, she would just plead the fifth because she hasn't gone to trial yet. So, of course, she's not going to get up there and say anything, you know, before her own own trial. Or two, she would get up there and say um, some damning things that would just straight up be bad for Adam. John, however, did testify uh, against Adam because that was part of his plea agreement. On November the 4th, after deliberating for two hours, the jury found Adam guilty of first degree murder, grand theft and grand theft auto. Next up was the penalty phase, where the jury had to decide if Adam should receive life in prison or the death penalty. The prosecution introduced evidence that Adam had committed the crimes while on felony probation, and they also had three people read victim impact statements. The defense had that doctor, Dr. Gamachi, as well as a counselor from a foster group home and Adam's biological mother, uh, they all testified, and they had two of his aunts and a friend testify as well. The defense was allowed to tell the jury about the sentences that Valesa and John had received. And according to an appeal document, the defense, quote, urged the jury to consider the treatment of other co-defendants in determining its recommended sentence, end quote. I guess this idea of not punishing one more harshly than the other. Right. um, Or, you know, along those lines. Uh, So on November the 5th, after deliberating for just 80 minutes, didn't take very long, the jury voted seven to five for the death penalty. But that wasn't the end of Adam's legal battles. And we're going to get into the end of this story after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. Whether you made New Year's resolutions or not, the beginning of the year always feels like a fresh start. Whether you have specific goals for self-care or you just want to feel better, Noom Weight has you covered. Noom uses a psychological approach to help empower you with practical knowledge and skills you need to build smarter and more sustainable long-term habits and behaviors, which is why more than 75% of its users actually complete the program. What I really love about Noom is there isn't some crazy plan where I'm stressing myself out and not enjoying food, which would stink because food is basically my love language. Noom is all about learning to eat, not what to eat. Some days when it's between grilled chicken and fried chicken, I'm going fried. And that's okay. I didn't fail some system or fail myself. I just ate what I wanted to eat. And next time I may go with a grilled chicken. But if I don't, that's okay because I am learning in an environment that's not judgmental and is there to encourage you to reach your goals, whatever they may be. I'm looking to live a healthier lifestyle and Noom helps support this. And for those of you who have tried other plans and not felt successful, check out Noom. With Noom Weight, you are the boss. You make Noom fit into your life, not the other way around. You can give 5, 10, or 15 minutes a day. How much you want to spend on the app is totally up to you. Sign up for your trial and get psychology-based support and motivation to reach your goals at noom.com slash moms. That's noom.com slash moms to sign up for your trial. There's never been a better time to take care of yourself than now. Whether something in your life is interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, the licensed professional therapists with BetterHelp want to help you become the best you this year. BetterHelp is professional counseling that you can do right from the comfort of your home through weekly video or phone sessions. 
I've used BetterHelp for a while now, and I can't tell you what a relief it is just to get all my thoughts out to a professional without ever having to leave the house. I deal with anxiety and depression and have most of my adult life, so just having someone I can talk to with these different scenarios or those immediate problems that pop up in life has really been invaluable, especially the last couple of years. Of course, anything you share with your BetterHelp counselor is completely confidential. And best of all, BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Financial aid is also available. Whether you're struggling with family issues, sleep, stress, or more, BetterHelp will match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with them in under 24 hours. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. We want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash moms. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash moms. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here, a brand new dermatologist-approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great, gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered, too, with a training pant that's ultra soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we were talking about Adam sentencing, that he had just been sentenced by the jury to the death penalty. So next, the judge held, held a hearing where he weighed the aggravating and mitigating factors for Adam. The judge found three aggravating factors and five mitigating factors. The aggravating factors were, number one, the crime was committed while Adam was on felony probation. Number two, the crime was heinous, atrocious, or cruel. And three, the crime was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner without any pretense of moral or legal justification. But the mitigating factors were, one, Adam was under the influence of LSD at the time of the offense. Two, Adam had no prior convictions for assaultive behavior. Three, Adam had a deprived childhood and suffered hardships during his youth. Four, Adam's a skilled writer and artist and can be expected to make a contribution to the prison community by sharing his knowledge, skills, and experience. And five, Adam's age at the time of the crime. On December 17th, 1999, after weighing the factors against each other, the judge followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Adam to death. It was a really big deal that the judge sentenced Adam to death without a unanimous vote for the death sentence. As we said, it was seven to five. Florida was one of only four states that allowed the death penalty without a unanimous vote. This would later change, which we're going to talk about a little later. Adam's conviction and sentence were automatically appealed to the Supreme Court of Florida. One of his main grounds for appeal was that his confession to police should not have been admitted at the trial because he hadn't been read his Miranda rights at the beginning of the interview. Adam also said that his confession shouldn't have been allowed into evidence because he was sleep deprived and on LSD during the interview. However, it had previously been proven that neither one of these grounds were actually based in reality. Adam was in custody for about 15 hours before he was interviewed by police. While this interview did take place at around 5.30 a.m., Adam himself had admitted that he had been sleeping for the majority of those 15 hours that he was in custody. So this sleep-deprived claim was really disproven. An expert for the defense testified that LSD's effects last for around 12 hours. So unless Adam had actually taken LSD while he was in custody, then he wasn't on LSD during the interview. So therefore, this claim was disproven. Another main ground for appeal was that the jury didn't unanimously vote for the death penalty. On September 11th, 2003, the Supreme Court of Florida affirmed Adam's conviction and sentence. The court ruled that Adam's confession was admissible because he gave a full confession after he was read his Miranda rights and after he signed his waiver. Just because he said he was involved prior to his rights being read did not make his second confession inadmissible, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Like, 
sure, you didn't have it the first time you confessed, but you went on and confessed a second time, and that's the one we're counting here. So the court ruled that in the state of Florida, receiving the death penalty by a majority vote was not unconstitutional. This later changed in January of 2020 when the Supreme Court ruled that Florida cannot allow non-unanimous verdicts in death penalty cases. So as time goes on with Valesa and Adam being in two separate jails, their romance started to sour and they eventually did turn against each other. Adam started talking to other women and he was often in trouble for talking to female inmates at the jail. A few months after her arrest, Valesa changed her story about what happened that night and she placed the blame completely on Adam. She claimed that she was in her bedroom high on LSD the whole time that Adam was murdering her mom. Further, she claimed that she hated herself for not rescuing her mom, and she said that she thought Adam was, quote, the devil. On April 10, 2000, Valesa's trial began. The prosecution said that Valesa and Adam killed Vicky together, and they did it for one reason, because Valesa would do anything to be with Adam, who was a man that her mom did not approve of. The prosecution said that Valesa was not the primary killer, but that she was a principal to the murder. They admitted that Adam was the one who inflicted the final and fatal stab wounds. However, the prosecution urged the jury to find Valesa just as culpable as Adam since it was her idea and she was with him during the attack. In their closing statement, the prosecution said, quote, Adam would do anything for Valesa, anything. He did do anything for her. He murdered Vicki Robinson, end quote. The defense said that Valesa had nothing to do with Vicki's death, that Adam and John were the only two responsible. According to the Tampa Tribune, the defense tried to portray Valesa as a victim, you know, of this older man that was taking advantage of a younger girl. Essentially, Adam, you know, manipulated Valesa into committing this crime. So just as John had testified at Adam's trial, he also had to testify at Valesa's trial as part of his plea deal. And the defense said that John's story was just a lie, that Valesa did not participate in Vicky's murder, even though, you know, he got up on the stand and said the true story. On April 21st, after deliberating for two and a half days, the jury found Valesa guilty of third-degree murder and grand theft auto. If she had been found guilty of first-degree murder, she would have been automatically sentenced to life in prison without parole since she was too young to be eligible for the death penalty. On May 30th, Valesa was sentenced, though, to just 15 years for murder and five years for grand theft. Wow. In 2017, Adam requested a new sentence under the 2016 Hearst v. Florida ruling. According to Death Penalty Info, prior to this ruling, quote, Florida death penalty law required a jury to make a sentencing recommendation to the judge who would then later hold a separate hearing and determine whether sufficient aggravating circumstances existed to justify imposing the death penalty, end quote. Under the statute, the jury rendered only an advisory sentence of life or death and did not specify the factual base for its recommendation. The court held that the judge sentencing requirement violated the Sixth Amendment, which guarantees the right to trial by jury, saying, quote, the Sixth Amendment requires a jury, not a judge, to find each fact necessary to impose a sentence of death. A jury's mere recommendation is not enough, end quote. So if you'll recall, this is exactly what happened with Adam's case. The jury recommended death, then the judge determined that if there was enough aggravating circumstances to justify the death penalty. So because this is what happened to Adam, his death sentence was overturned. That meant the prosecution could either reseek the death penalty, leading to a new jury being picked to determine if Adam should receive life or death, or they could let Adam's sentence be converted to life in prison without parole. At first, the prosecution planned to reseek the death penalty, but then they decided not to due to Adam's age at the time of his crime, his mental health, the difference between his sentence and Valesa's and John's, and the original jury's split decision. Instead, Adam's sentence would be converted to life in prison without the chance for parole. On May 24, 2021, at his resentencing hearing, Adam said that not a single day goes by that he doesn't think of what he did. He said, quote, how I wish I could turn back the clocks of time and change what happened, end quote. Adam said, quote, Miss Robinson had so much light and love for the world and showed me kindness. Her loss is a great tragedy that should never have happened. To her family and loved ones, I express my deepest sorrow for their loss, end quote. So where are they all now, you might be wondering? In December 2013, Valesa, who was 30 years old at that time, was released from prison. 
She hasn't really spoken with the public since her release, but according to some reports, she did give birth to a baby boy and she was in a relationship and was living somewhere in Florida. In October 2019, 40-year-old John was also released from prison. In April of 2020, he then got into an argument with his girlfriend and things turned physical, but he wasn't arrested at that point. But then again, in June of 2020, John got into another physical altercation with his girlfriend, and he was arrested and charged. He was released on bond, and he was told to stay away from this woman. In October of 2020, John rode his bike to a nail salon where he knew his, I guess now ex-girlfriend, would be at. And he tried to force his way into the salon. He was calling her names, and he rode in very close proximity to her. The next day, John rode his bike to Walmart and got within 100 feet of his ex-girlfriend. And for that, he was arrested and he was charged with two counts of violating his pretrial release. In March of 2021, John was found guilty of two counts of battery and violating pretrial release. And he was sentenced to just a year of probation. He was also ordered to attend 29 weeks of a domestic violence program. In December of 2021, John was arrested after he violated his parole by testing positive for marijuana, and he is currently awaiting his arraignment. Adam is currently incarcerated in the Mayo Correctional Institution in Mayo, Florida, and he will not be released. He will be in prison for the rest of his life. What a wild story. And this is local-ish to us. I've never heard of this story. Yeah, Um, me either. But it follows such a a pattern of these kind of things that have happened where kids, especially whenever it's a girl, I'm thinking back to an Aaron uh, case with Aaron. Kathy. Thank you, Kathy, in the beginning that we uh, covered. And um, yeah, where like the boyfriend, like their love, they have to be together and this is how we're going to be together. And of course, it sours after all this happens because this is like primetime emotions and hormones and this age and everything and it's like oh my gosh at the end of the day this this person's gone forever it's just so sad yeah it is really sad um to think uh, these stories always like i said these are the ones that really keep me up at night i feel the same way like those are the ones where you're like you can do everything you think is right as a parent and either have this like outside influence that comes in or you know drugs are, can be a factor in this and All kinds of stuff where you're just like, oh, it would never happen to me. But then you have to think like, yeah, you can't control. They're not the same kid they were at two. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. No, (laughs) no. I totally get it. And a lot of the times, you know, people have – people are very judgmental towards other parents, I find. Like in general, that's like a thing. Whenever you're a parent, you're constantly being judged by other people and other parents who might do things differently than than you do. And people always think that their way is the best way. But, you know, it sounds like Vicky really tried – multiple different things, you know, and at the end of the day, like there is no instruction manual for how to raise kids or how to raise teenagers or how to deal with some of these really, really hard things, you know, when when your kids are going, really going through something and, you know, Valesa was, it started with her parents' divorce and it sounds like Vicky was just trying to survive and, you know, to work and to be able to keep a roof over their heads, you know, in the midst of all this. And it's really sad, you know, it really is sad because it's, it's hard to imagine like that things take a turn like to this degree where things mm-hmm. end up working out this way, but it, it's just really hard. And like you said, I feel like it, it's not like I'm saying, oh, this could happen to anybody. But at the same right. time, it's like you just never know what's it going could. to happen in life. It really I actually could. say it could. Yeah. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> you really don't know. You can do everything you think that's right, but you just don't know there's other factors that go into it. So it is like me hearing a story like this as a parent, I think like, I don't know what you could do, you know, like, cause you, as like a, your own self-soothing kind of thing, you're like, what would I do differently? But then you think like, there's, you just don't know. You could do everything differently or you could do everything the same and have totally different results. You right. just do not know. And so the whole thing is just terribly sad. It reminds me of the episode that we did not too long ago about the family that was on wife swap. And, um, you know, one of the brothers tragically murdered his mother and uh, one of his other brothers. But the living family members were saying like, we didn't, you know, didn't feel that way. We did not feel the same way that our brother apparently did. And like, they turned out differently. So it kind of goes to show that, like you said, you can have two people in the same environment, siblings, for example, and one of them turns out one way and the other one turns out a completely different way. So it's like, 
that's all also fascinating and also like a rabbit hole. Like it's fun to like go down, like, you know, seeing like how yeah. different families like dynamics are and like, but it is weird to think about how, like, how did this happen? And it sounds like Valessa's sister, you know, didn't, did not have the same struggles that Valessa right. had. So. Exactly. So you're looking at two people in the same environment. And right. so, yeah, there's just, there's just other circumstances that happen. So, oh, goodness gracious. Okay. So we're going to um, move on. Are you ready to turn the page and move on to last thing before we go? Let's do it. Okay. So last month at some point in December, we had talked about um, fun holidays or noteworthy days, I guess, um, in December that are, weren't related to Christmas. And those were kind of fun. And since we also have said that um, January is super boring and nothing is ever happening, we are going to prove ourselves wrong and talk about things that actually are happening in January. There you go. <laughs> All right, Melissa. So did you find some fun and exciting days to celebrate this month? I did. Of course, January 17th, we know is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That is like our holiday of January. Of course. That's the of January course. holiday. That is a January holiday. But if you're wanting to, like, if you're feeling a little Christmassy, I've got one for you that is kind of interesting. Why would I, who is feeling Christmassy? I don't know, Mandy. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you're getting a jump start on next year. I am um, not. <laughs> okay. Well, how about this? If you say in your mind, screw Christmas, I'm done with this. This is the holiday for you. That's okay. what I mean. Okay. Okay. It's called January 13th. It's called St. Nuts Day, which is even just fun to say. <laughs> So <laughs> it's also known as Little Christmas Day where Scandinavians plunder their trees. So all of their decorations are taken down, the candies and cookies are eaten, and the tree is removed from the home. It's this festive day where families and friends get together. Mine has been gone since the day after Christmas. Cannot celebrate. <laughs> but it was interesting because some Danish duke was assassinated by his cousin and rival on January 7th to oh. usurp the Danish throne, leading to a civil war, which in turn led to Nut being declared a saint. So wow. Happy Saint Nuts Day. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, you can still celebrate it when you listen. You have two more days to celebrate Saint Nuts Day. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. I could okay. make more jokes, but I'm gonna stop. <laughs> okay. So most of the ones that I found are actually exciting things that are happening at the end of the month. But I did find Perfect. one that's yeah, I did find one that's already happened um, that I appreciated. So I didn't get a lot of details on this because I think it maybe is a little self-explanatory, but then again, maybe not. So January the 3rd is or was National Fruitcake Toss Day. <sighs> so first of all, fruitcake is absolutely disgusting. Can we all agree on that? I mean, you and I can gr agree on that. And that might be the only food we've ever agreed on. Yeah. So I'm t so my interpretation of fruitcake toss day is the day that you literally just make a holiday out of throwing away all the disgusting fruitcake <laughs> yeah. like, is left from people. I guess. <sighs> Couldn't you have a tossing competition? I that's think what that's I'm what thinking. it should be. Like, I'm thinking also it could just be like a throwing fruitcake game day. Oh, so good. Bring I your mother-in-law that gives it to yeah. you and have her watch you <laughs> toss it as far as you can. But it doesn't go that far because it's solid as a rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Fruitcake is so gross. I I don't know. Bless my sweet grandmother. She is such a sweet woman. For years and years, she made fruitcakes for everyone for Christmas and would give them all out. And, like, I just felt bad because I instantly would throw it away. Like, instantly. We'd get home with yeah. it and toss it in the trash can. I'm not going to eat that. I know. It's it's not even, like, let's pretend for a day. It's like, you know what? The trash comes tomorrow. This right. is gone. It's gone. <laughs> I'm going to finish mine on this one. So this is because uh, I have a little more information. Celebrated on both February 7th and January 27th. So it's a January holiday, but also a February 7th one. This is E-Day. So it's in countries that use day month. Uh, it's January 27th. So 27 slash 1. That's whenever it's – okay, let me explain this so right. I get it. So I get what you're saying. So that's how they write the date. Yes. So it depends on how you write the date. So E-Day celebrates the mathematical constant E, which is approximately equal to – 2.718288182845904523536028747135267475724709995. That's the best I've ever read anything in our entire time of recording. That is amazing. I've never done that. <laughs> I thought E on your calculator meant error, but apparently it means that number I just said. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> when you get an E, don't you think error? Am I an idiot? No. Apparently it means this. It means this. So if you want to celebrate this day, it's like Pi Day, but like not as cool. Um, you can celebrate it either January 27th if your country does 27 slash 1 as a number because that's like 2.71. Oh, or February it. 7th, 
two slash seven one. Yeah. I so anyway, it. yeah, it's not great. I never claim for it to be, but if you want to celebrate E slash Air Day slash not reading that again, you can do it on February 7th or January 27th. Live big in the future, guys. Wow. Okay. All right. So um, <laughs> I'm not really sure what to do with that. There's nothing to do with it. I don't know what happened. I just <laughs> went off the deep end. Okay. So <laughs> I found a lot of days that I really am excited about coming up in like the end of January. So starting with the 22nd, it is one of my favorite days that I didn't even know existed. But I mean, I should have known that it existed. I just didn't know that this was the day. It's National Hot Sauce Day. Oh, that's a good one. It's National Hot Sauce Day. Yeah. And I am a hot sauce lover, a connoisseur, just as much as I like peanut butter, which I have mentioned before, I like hot sauce just as much. And it actually works out great for me because January 24th is actually National Peanut Butter Day. So if you're a peanut butter lover, I know I didn't know that all of my days were this month. I am sitting here thinking January has nothing in store for me. And I didn't even know that I have a lot to celebrate. (laughs) You have so much to be thankful for. I'm so happy for you. (laughs) And then, Melissa, this last one we can end on. This is a day I'm pretty sure they put this on the calendar just for you and I. Okay. January 25th is National Observe the Weather Day. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> a day we celebrate all year long. Exactly, exactly. So that's it. Yeah. So as you can see, there's a lot yeah. in, in January. In January. And I can't wait for a review that's like, I will let you guys talk about the weather one day a year on National Observe the yeah. Weather. But after that, I'm done. <laughs> that's it. That's it. All right, Melissa. Well, that was it for this week. Uh, I think I think that's it. I think that's enough. That's it. That is plenty. That is actually plenty. <laughs> All right, guys, we will see you back next week. Same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.